Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious. Today, bridging the space between us is Bruce Smith, who was part of the other British invasion of the 1960s when he was one of the Brit engineers coming over here to help us land on the moon. Welcome, Bruce Smith. Glad Thank to have you on Stay Curious. Thank you very much, Mark. Tell us a little bit about your wife, Heather's over here. You both took a tour of our museum. And Jessica Galloway, our, our computer engineer and co-producer of this show, snagged you to get us on the program today. And tell us where you live and why you're doing here on the Space Coast. Okay, we live in Los Altos, Los Altos in California, in the middle of Silicon Valley. And we're visiting the Space Coast because we love it in Florida, in this particular coast. And we came especially because... Uh, someone that we know called Adrian Harrison, who works for BBC Newsnight and is making uh, shows on the Apollo Brits for showing on British television. He demanded that we come here because <laughs> he said, this is a wonderful museum. Well, we, we uh, thank you, Adrian Harrison, for that. And I looked him up on YouTube last night. He's well known in in England and, and does a lot of these type of documentaries and so forth. And uh, so you can uh, check that out. Uh, 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 Adrian Harrison, A-D-R-A-I-N yes. Harrison. And right. Jessica will put that in our comments right. there. He works for BBC News Night yeah. and, uh, 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 and produces a lot of things. Uh, well, actually, uh, Anita, our uh, office manager, gave you the tour, uh, Anita Truex, and she gave you the tour and coming up to me and Mark, you, this guy worked on Apollo. You got to talk to him. And of course, we want to talk to Bruce Smith here because this is what we are all about at this museum is preserving the birth of the American space age and igniting the future generation. And what do you think of some of the exhibits here that you saw, you and your wife, Heather? Well, I think they're, they're very personal and, and quite comprehensive. And your room full of, of uh, women astronauts is quite stunning. I don't think that I've ever seen such a collection of really accomplished astronaut ladies in my life. And I think you've got all of them there. Well, we do, and you're a lot like me. Any room full of women is stunning to me, Bruce. <laughs> and so, uh, but we do have 60 seven now astronauts, women that have been to space. We got two more to add up there. We put the we put Wally Funk up there that was one of the original Mercury Lady astronaut trainees because of the Virgin Galactic flight she was on. Two ladies that were on the, the uh, Virgin Galactic, Wally Funk was on the Blue Origin suborbital. But we got two more to add, and that was the two women that were on that fabulous Inspiration right. 4 flight over the weekend. Did you right. watch that? Uh, we didn't, unfortunately. Well, it launched here last Wednesday, but there wasn't much news on it because Netflix is their backer and they're going to uh, save it for everyone to go uh, uh, see it at a big extravaganza, I think. But yes, uh, space has really opened up, but we're going to talk to Bruce about his 50 years ago. He was working on the Apollo program with Bendex. He's going to tell us a little bit about how he got from Yorkshire, England, and your wife is from Warwickshire, is yes, that right? Warwickshire, right. and uh, I'm just panning those British accents a little bit because uh, some people think I've got an accent, I guess, I don't know, uh, but it's from Ohio, all right? We're so from the we're from the Midwest, actually. We, we crick and, and then I got a few y'alls in me from Tennessee, oh. but we're gonna enjoy having you talk about your career and Apollo 16 was part of his uh, uh, expertise with Bendex Corporation dealing with the heat flow experiment. And uh, for those of you Apollo aficionados know what happened on Apollo 16, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. You got a quick comment, Jessica? Oh, okay. Uh, she's getting my cue cards ready, and she hasn't put up the ums and ahs yet, so I guess I'm doing pretty good. But we got a birthday to get out of the way here because Bruce Smith, we love our astronauts that are in our communities doing things. There's over 300 American astronauts out there. And this is one of them. Bobby Satcher is 56 years old today. And he was born in Hampton, Virginia. And he grew up in Denmark, South Carolina, graduating from the Denmark Olar High School. 
and he went to MIT, all right, uh, you got to be pretty smart to go to Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology, a doctor of chemical engineering. He was the last African-American to go to space uh, in, until uh, Victor, um, what's Victor's last name on the Crew Dragon, went up there. Uh, and uh, he also um, did two spacewalks on STS-129, all right, and... Uh, I, obviously, he's at the end of the, the shuttle era, or if we'd been flying those beautiful orbiters, he'd, he'd probably had many more flights. But happy 56th birthday to Bobby Satcher. And wanted to put up there for the benefit of uh, old school me and Bruce here, that on this date in 1975, all right, uh, oh, let me go, I went there, go that way. This date in 1975, that is astronaut Owen Garrett, one of three astronauts on the uh, Skylab 3 mission, which was the second crewed mission. And he's doing a spacewalk with his commander, Alan Bean. And Bruce, what the only purpose of this dangerous spacewalk was to retrieve film cassettes, okay? Film cassettes uh, that they were, that the solar telescope was putting this data on. And my executive director, Karen Conklin, said one day, Mark, there's a whole generation out there that doesn't know what film is. And there's a film canister, 35 millimeter film. Okay, a good old Fuji roll of film there. And this film is 24 exposures, all right, which is what you got to take pictures with in a regular camera, not 240 pictures and on a vacation and 24 of them being what you ate. All right, so you had to conserve and know what you were doing, but the film of the scientific instruments was outside of the spacecraft, not inside. So they had to do a spacewalk to retrieve it and put a new load of film in it. And of course, on the Apollo missions, 15, 16, and 17, the pilot had to do a spacewalk to retrieve the film canisters to bring back to Earth. Today, digital's taken over. People don't even know what film is, but this is the exposed side. And uh, uh, in a way, I'm glad it is that way. But did you ever work in a film dark room, Bruce? Yes, often. Often. I miss the, sm the smell of the fixer and the red light and that water flowing in the background all the time. It was right. always a, an escape from the world, and you're creating something very creative, right? Right. Yeah, good. Well, we're talking to Bruce Smith here. He is a engineer, and we're going to... Uh, as we bring up this photograph, I'm going to let him do most of the talking here. Bruce, tell us a little bit about your background. Here you are in your 20s working on something that pertains to the Apollo program. How did you get involved with the Apollo program, sir? All right. Well, uh, as you say, Mark, I came from Yorkshire in uh, Hull in Yorkshire. And I mention this because uh, subsequently we met someone when we first arrived in Ann Arbor in Michigan. Ann Arbor, Michigan. You hear that, Dave Stang? He's been to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Yeah. So um, the first person just about that we met was uh, Dr. Keith Peacock. And it turned out that he and I went to the same high school. And he was one year ahead of me. And he has a doctorate. Uh, and he uh, came to the United States in, I think, 1967. Mm -hmm. And he happened to find a photograph of us on a hike uh, at the age of 14. Oh, wow. And I haven't seen him since. <laughs> and then I met him in Ann Arbor. Yeah. Right? And what's even more curious is that he preceded me in on the heat flow, lunar heat flow experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, and he worked at uh, Bendix uh, with uh, Roger Carlson and, uh, of course, uh, the principal investigator, Dr. Marcus Langseth, uh, John Shute, Steve Keim, and uh, Roger G Carlson of Gul Galton Industries. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go. Dave says go blue. Oh, yeah. Dave. Right. Hmm? One of our commenters is from uh, the Michigan area, and because I'm from Ohio, we have a rivalry about that team up north. Up oh, there. So okay. Just a fun little. Uh, we've, got, we've got people, Bruce, sorry to interrupt you there, but on Facebook, 
Twitch and YouTube enjoying this. That's nice. And you know it's the first day of, of, of autumn here in the right. Northern Hemisphere, but our good friend Dean Salswittle is, is thanking God that it winter's over in New Zealand as he can start celebrating spring. So continue with your affiliation getting involved with the okay, Apollo program okay. at Bendex there. Um, yes, there was a Dr. Uh, Wexler at Arthur D. Little who had a huge hand in developing the probes that you see on the photograph okay. uh, that I happen to be holding well, there. What are you doing here in this photograph? I'm, I am loading the, po the, the probes into a cryogenic chamber mm -hmm. uh, in order to stabilize them and test them for uh, temperature differential measurements and uh, absolute temperature measurements. Okay. Those are the Apollo 15 probes. Because on the moon, the temperature fluctuates from what to what? Well, uh, on the surface, it fluctuates from uh, very low temperatures uh, uh, to uh, rather high temperatures. Yeah, 200 below to about 200 above is the range Fahrenheit. Yes. And, In uh, fact, I think it goes down to 80 uh, 8 Kelvin uh, below. Okay. And, uh, Throwing some Kelvin and, at us there. Got to and, calculate and, some and nearly stuff 400, here. well, that's the way it is, Kelvin. Anyway, I know. <laughs> uh, nearly 400 Kelvin on the surface. And what's interesting is that the regolith is made of uh, almost crystalline material like marbles. And uh, the, the soil of the moon. And, the and, and the temperature variation from the surface down, you know, these enormous changes on the surface, mm -hmm. and then you get down to uh, one foot below, and the temperature change is less than a degree. Really? And when you get uh, another foot below, and it's almost non-existent, it's almost a perfect insulator. And the only, uh, the only thing is that when we put the ho the probes in the hole that we drilled in the moon, 10 foot deep, mm -hmm. uh, we had to make sure that we put the uh, uh, the reflective barriers to stop any radiation getting down the probe stem. Otherwise, it would have failed. So you're putting probes in the moon on there. Uh, we're, uh, we're putting probes in the moon. On, it started with Apollo 15 uh, drilling in there. I don't think uh, thir 14 or 12 did well, it Well, 13 was, it had. It had the, it, yeah. It had them. And on Apollo 13, I got a dry run through the day before the Apollo 13 mission, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. um, when we had a full day simulation of things going wrong, uh, which uh, was pretty harrowing for me to be on online for about eight hours dealing with problems on Apollo 13. Mm -hmm, right. And then uh, we, we left, of course, and Apollo 13 went wrong, and we witnessed Fred Hayes as being really the hero on, because he had a lot of technical knowledge about the spacecraft, and he really saved them. He did. Fred Hayes, uh, uh, if you didn't know that, he is our, our emeritus board member here at the museum. Great friends with our chairman of the board, Charlie Mars. And uh, yes, he knew the Grumman lunar module inside and out better than... He was actually the Grumman representative for the Apollo astronauts. So he knew the inside out of that beautiful... Uh, that had been LM7, I think. Uh, was the uh, number the uh, tail number of that uh, lunar module? Well, what was nice is that be because we observed Fred Hayes in action, when uh, John Young tripped over the cable uh, going to the electronics box on the heat flow experiment mm -hmm. on the moon, um, we Fred Hayes was our principal advisor. Oh, and. Uh, I remember staying up all night uh, working out how to disconnect the AstroMate connector from the station, how to take the probes out of the holes and pull them out of the springs, how to uh, get them back to the spacecraft because I was actually a fairly good project engineer. I really knew the stuff inside out. Mm -hmm. I knew how to take away the con take apart the connectors and uh, we were proposing uh, uh, really sanding off 
the film on the 40 conductor Kapton cable mm -hmm. uh, to expose the copper so that we could then bend it over, put it in the connector and screw it down again and make the connections. Now, the only problem was that there were no tools in the spacecraft. Oh, to like strip the wires, so to there speak. There was nothing. Wow. And we had to use a camera slide to uh, undo the screws. Um, I mean, oh. just going through developing these procedures, um, just remember, the astronaut understand. Okay. Uh, keep it really simple, otherwise we're not going to make it. And so um, we did, and we came up with all the methods. And Dr. Marcus Langseth suggested using a lunar rock as sandpaper. And he found the exact rock that we needed. Um, and uh, we stayed up all night. And then the next day, there was a meeting with Rocco Patron. Okay. And, uh, uh, and also, uh, and, and let's see, who, who was the science uh, guy? Uh, he, Jim Lovell. Jim, okay. And all of those other people. Uh, we had a big meeting, big discussions. They all decided that, in fact, we could recover, but the spacecraft was overheating by about 10 degrees, and they wanted to go and find a Genesis rock. Oh. And so they said, sorry, Mark, Mark Langseth, we're going to have to wait until Apollo 17. Wow. We're not going to repair it. That's the story Bruce Smith, who was a Bendex engineer 50 years ago, talking about in April 1972, Apollo 16 on the moon, the heat flow experiment was set up. John Young, the great astronaut, actually tripped over and pulled out the connector. And you just heard the, a story that probably never been told about trying to use rocks and a jetic about that. We're going to show this slide here, Bruce, right. uh, of the ALSEP experiments that uh, to let our uh, younger viewers know that during the Apollo era, they set up, the, that's the LSEP experiment there that had broken uh, on there, and they had drilled holes down into the ground to put the probes in. And can you go back to the slide of the whole layout there, the cartoon, in the central station that had a nuclear uh, generator, right? Yes, it nuclear did. Nuclear powered. And they had different uh, uh, experiments off of this. Now, this started with Apollo 11, the first landing, but it was very simple. And then in 15, 16, and 17, uh, uh, developed more uh, experiments to put on there. The heat flow experiments in the green there in the bottom. Right. But, but this was one astronaut was responsible for all this, correct? And the other one was out doing different things while the other astronaut, uh, maybe they helped each other a little bit. But They, they did, legibly, on deploying these uh, instruments. But the um, Apollo lunar surface... Uh, the package, experiment package, it had uh, numerous experiments. It had... Uh, a, uh, Charlie uh, Duke with the picture you brought in. Yes, that's right. Uh, that, that's... Uh, yeah, he was, he was uh, John uh, Young's 16, uh, uh, walking 16 probe, 16, probe, sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Forgive me. Um, I think I'm getting old and senile. Uh, but, uh, I only but, know this stuff to combat Alzheimer's. <laughs> that, that's, I don't do puzzles <laughs> or games. I memorize space right. history. Right, but... But the, the Apollo Lunar Surface Heat Flow Experiment Package was actually a very advanced set of instruments. It had a laser reflector that would allow you to determine the distance between the Earth and the Moon to, you know, a couple of centimeters, actually. And they're still there, Bruce. Still doing it. In fact, um, the sitcom, uh, American sitcom Big Bang Theory, they actually were on the roof of their Pasadena. To try and try to determine what the... Uh, atmosphere was like uh, on the moon. There was uh, the passive seismometer uh, that John Bresky was uh, responsible for mm -hmm. at Bendix, and that was one of the primary uh, experiments. The, the second primary experiment was the heat flow, because if you're going to uh, explore a planet, scientifically, mm -hmm. the two things you need to do the most is determine the, uh, the seismic uh, condition of the planet and the heat flow drives the plates, drives the volcanoes mm -hmm. on the Earth. It drives 
all of the uh, movement of continents. I mean, heat flow is pretty damned important. So uh, to determine heat flow, because you cannot measure it directly, mm -hmm. uh, you have to measure thermal conductivity uh, and you have to measure differential temperature. So these probes, when inserted in the regol regolith, <clears throat> they, um, I, I think there were uh, two sets on each section of the probes mm -hmm. uh, uh, to determine the absolute temperature and the differential temperature. And in subsequent testing, by the way, uh, in that earlier photo that I showed you, when we tested two probes together, we were getting measurements between the two probes that corresponded within better than 10 milli-degrees absolute temperature and better than one milli-degree Kelvin differential temperature. Hmm. And to be making uh, temperature measurements with that kind of accuracy on the moon when you couldn't probably achieve it at the time in National Standards Labs wow, was pretty phenomenal. Yeah. We were looking at a picture of John Young, and we put up a picture of those probes off of this uh, piece of machinery that was on the moon. And uh, it had all these wires on it. so fascinating to hear Bruce Smith here, uh, who was part of the British invasion of scientists that came over to help NASA. He's going to tell us about that in just a second. But... So fascinating to hear you talk about the lunar surface and the temperatures in it and so forth and how important it is for us to know how this alien world works. It's the first alien world we've been on and, and these, these type of experiments are going on right now on Mars. Right. With the uh, InSight probe on Mars has got a heat flow experiment on it. There, there, it does have one. And, uh, and, and they're uh, trying to drill holes, yeah, too. Yeah, they're having a hard time drilling those holes, too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what else we have here photo-wise? That's part of the... Uh... Uh, oh, this is the LSEP uh, package, uh, one of the pallets. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the probe box at the side. Okay. That has Some two black. probes folded within the box inside. And uh, I believe that's the Apollo... 17 box. Okay. Uh, and Stowed uh, away in one of the bays of the lunar module. I think it was bay four. Well, right. So, right. And uh, the, you, we keep, Marty's we, we not keep here clicking. to tell us. Marty will be back uh, well, in a day or two. He's on vacation, all of us. Yeah. Stay well, curious fans. We keep flipping backs and forwards between this and the heat flow electronics box mm -hmm. and the probes and the connector. The electronics box had uh, many, many uh, printed circuit boards with multiple layers. Um, and the electronics box was really quite clever because uh, it excited the, the probe uh, thermometers, the platinum resistant thermometers. It excited them more positively than negatively. And uh, over a, the duration of you know, a second or so, um, there was no opportunity for the electronic box to, to introduce any errors. So any drift in the amplifiers or any other errors were totally eliminated by these methods. Mm. So you got really true readings from these platinum resistance thermometers. And this was groundbreaking technology for 1972. Uh, and... How does some of this translate 50 years later, Bruce, into things that, that our Stay Curious listeners could understand, things they're holding or using today? Anything come to mind? Well, I can, I can go back even just a tiny bit more. Okay. Because my first real job in, the, in Britain was a junior engineer on the first solid-state computer, designing the first solid-state computer at International Computers. Mm -hmm. And like our phones what, now. what was interesting is that the maximum size of the RAM was 32K. 32K. And it occupied, it occupied a space probably from that far side wall Ten over to away. here. Wow. And it, it had ferrite beads. And uh, I think the drums were 12K. Wow. Uh, 
and you had tapes. These were very expensive computers, by the way. But, you know, we come from, I mean, we live currently in Los Altos. Yes. Guess who, who lived in Los Altos? Steve Jobs. Oh, did he? Okay. He lived in a house very much like ours, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And he, he did his work with Wozniak. Yeah, and the, the point is that you now, I mean, I have my, my iPhone 12, and I, I've got 256 gigs, and I could have had a lot more if I wanted to. Jeez. And I am just astounded Thanks. that you can get so much memory in such a small space. I know, a kilobyte is 1,000 uh, 1, kilobytes to a megabyte, and people don't even use megabytes. And I talk about the early camera store that I right. uh, managed with the, the uh, all the cameras were sold with an eight megabyte card. And I had doctors and lawyers calling me up and saying, when you get those 16 and 32 megabytes we're, t we're hearing about, let me know. And it was a dollar a megabyte price. And, and I, I remember reading several books that memory was going to come down and be so cheap that we wouldn't believe it. And I don't believe it. I mean, get I got a, I bought a two terabyte a, a portable external drive just to keep my life in, you know, in there. And it, it well, is quite amazing. Well, I used to be fairly technically astute. I don't know it's about, I, yeah. don't, I don't know about now. But, but the fact that you've got the, one of our neighbors works for Apple and is designing, uh, you know, what? He's, he's designing chips mm -hmm. with, <clears throat> with separations on the traces that are so low, I mean, they're, they're just ridiculous. I mean, I've never heard anything like it. And, and when you see this memory, I've got to tell you, I have no idea how people are doing it. Because, I mean, I suppose I could look into it, but it is so phenomenal. How are they miniaturizing all of that? I have that? no yes, idea. It is just, it's just amazing. There's that, there's that law. But, uh, that, that law where technology, like, Doubles itself. I don't every know. yeah, doubles itself every three years now or something. I've We're talking. A, I just got an iPad. Yes. A whole terabyte and sixteen gigs of RAM. RAM. Yeah. yeah. It's more powerful than my laptop. Just as powerful as this computer we just bought. Don't you find it astounding? It's bananas. <laughs> and Jessica Galloway, who's uh, uh, commenting here. Uh, she's a big gamer, and gaming stuff has has, has changed the world. Uh, in there, but Bruce Smith here with us, uh, former Bendix engineer, changed the world 50 years ago with these these experiments that we were doing real science. The first Apollo 11, just we wanted to get there and get off the moon, grab some rocks. Apollo 12 pinpointed that landing next to Surveyor 3 that we sent there a year and a half earlier. 13 was going to do some science, and of course that was a uh, unhappy success when uh, uh, that you know, we got them back alive. 14 kind of got bogged in some regolith that was very deep, you know. So your first experiments on 15, 16, and 17 truly was exploring science in a new level, wasn't it, Bruce? Yes, it was, although 15 wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the probes were in, pl in place properly by Dave Scott. It was. Don't tell Dave <coughs> Scott that. He's one of four moonwalkers alive you know right um, him and jim but, Irwin were the but moonwalkers. the but the other one um how did he improperly set an experiment up there i'm curious well i'll tell you after all that training no i'll tell i'll tell you why because uh there's, there's a rotary percussion drill uh -huh. with uh fiberglass stems with uh tapered joints so that you could join the sections because the spacecraft wasn't big enough to get the whole depth of gotcha. the probes. Okay. Um, and uh, he, he was drilling the second hole and it wasn't going very well. And he pulled back and then pushed down. I thought he was going to kill himself. I can remember watching be that on TV. Be because, too. because he, he was leaning over us at this extreme angle, pushing down. But what had happened was that the, the the lunar regolith material had come up the flutes of the first of the first section of the drill, mm -hmm. and because the flute the the 
the fluting was discontinuous. It was spilling the material out at the low level inside the moon, and more and more material came up until uh, it, the, drill, the drill stem got hotter and hotter, and it just separated. Oh, wow. And then he pulled back and pushed down, and he was just pushing the, the next section of probe stem into the moon. And so when they went to put the probes in, they wouldn't go in. They uh -huh. only went in a short distance. Huh. Um, and after that, NASA was kind enough to have uh, Martin Marietta uh, redesign the whole drill section hmm. and allow a much longer section uh, at the lower end mm -hmm. with uh, a fairly secure joint at the, uh, hmm. the next end. Think of that, 50 years ago, we're drilling holes in the moon. They didn't have a long electric cord going from the lunar module over there, the power plant. No, this is the technology that every power tool out there today has its own power pack right. battery on it. That's and you guys were the ones that pioneered that 50 years ago. Well, it's certainly And, and, and to on. think about that 50 years ago, to have the torque on, on, on rock going into the moon, you know, well, uh, right. Pretty amazing, I think. Right. At one-sixth gravity. Well, one-sixth gravity helped the torque. Yeah, that, that's a good point right. there. But, right. Uh, in there. But these, these astronauts, I, I, you know, very few people talk about how skillful they had to be to deploy all of these instruments properly. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't deploy the seismometer properly, it wouldn't work. Right. If you didn't deploy... The other instruments properly, they just wouldn't work. Let alone all the other things that they did on there. They did Do we have any more pictures? There's uh, another one there. of, uh, But we've got the video cranked up here. Right. Okay, we've got a video of John Young in Orlando. is just 50 miles away from where we're here at the American Space Museum in downtown Titusville, Florida. And this is a video that we pulled out about three minutes long. We'll comment a little over it there of John with this heat flow experiment. Bruce, what's... Uh, I think... Uh, I think that might be Apollo 17. Okay. That might be Gene Cernan. All right. Well, that, whichever one it is, he's the stri he's got stripes on him, so and, and, and it is the that, commander. That is the... And you worked on 17, so... That is the heat flow box uh -huh. that you can see, and he has drilled the holes Okay. And he's taking the probes out of the box, and he's going to throw it. And then he tosses the box off into the distance. Huh. Had fun doing that at Wednesday. Well, graduate. I should tell you that has really special significance because he took a photograph of it. Uh huh. Um, and I, 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 th I think that uh, I'm not going to get into trouble at this late stage. No, we're not. I doubt it. But. Yeah. Okay. He's taking a picture of the box. Oh, but, that's what he's doing. He's taking a picture of yeah. the box now, that he now what is way off in the upper right, it right. looks like. But what is really interesting is that I have lots and lots of original photographs with the NASA numbers on. Correct. The red letters. And you can put the number into the NASA site, and it pulls up all the transcripts and all the videos and all of the mm -hmm. uh, audios of these missions. So, you know, what you were seeing there with, uh, with, with, with Gene Cernan tossing the box in the distance, uh, I pulled up recently from the NASA site. But what's interesting is that against all the rules, I, I would do a lot of things. Um, one of the things is that I, quietly etched our family's names on the inside of that box. Did you really? So that so that there was no debris, there's no extraneous chemicals, uh -huh. there's no nothing. Uh, but it was carefully uh, kind of etched, scratched in place uh, in such a way that it couldn't do any damage. And uh, we ended up with Heather's name on the moon, and my son Stefan's name on the moon, and my name on the moon. Putting so, them inside the boxes of the heat flow experiment. Yeah, 
that's the, the, the one over there that away. he tossed over. That's pretty neat. That, that, that's really neat. Kilroy was here. That's right. what a humans I, always want to say. Please don't prosecute me. No, no, no. Well, they'll have to bring back the evidence. And I think if we bring back the evidence, it'd be all worthwhile prosecuting you. Because okay. What do you think about that? You were, you were involved with this cutting edge thing 50, a, a half a century ago. And we talked a little bit earlier that, uh, you know, I'm a baby boomer in my 60s. We don't know we're that old until we look in the mirror, you know, the way we feel inside sometimes. But what do you feel about the last 50 years that we haven't gone back? And, and, and engineers like you working on this stuff and... Uh... Well, Mark, I've been extremely fortunate. I, uh, after my episodes working at uh, Bendix, mm -hmm. I joined Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. And I, I had more opportunities there to do more advanced things than you can imagine. I used to do a lot of uh, fundamental research on the independent research and development projects. And we developed, for example, a very lightweight aluminum lithium mm -hmm. that was used on the space shuttle external tank. Mm -hmm. We developed extremely advanced uh, feeds uh, based I worked at Marconi Instruments designing a microwave uh, power meter and learned all about all about my limitations oh, all about my limitations on uh, serious analytical analysis of uh, quadrige horns and when I was a at, Bendic, uh, at, uh, at Lockheed, I assembled a team and we developed all of the mathematics and the test techniques to vastly improve the performance of quadrige horns. And that is what? It, it is a way of transmitting and receiving data through antennas. Oh, okay. And, but the bottom line was that we could improve the performance by 11 dB. And you know what 3 dB is, right? Doubling. Okay. Another 3 dB is doubling again. Another 3 dB is doubling again. And we improved the state of the art by mm. 11 dB using wow. integrated electronics and, uh, and, and, and all of these things. Uh, I... I got to work on the Hubble Space Telescope. Right. Um, Hubble certainly needed some great I, antennas. And I, 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 I was the manager of, uh, of signal processing systems for the space systems company at Lockheed. And we would hire, train, and supply people to all of the specially super classified programs, but also to space telescope, all the things were being done on the International Space Station. And I ended up as manager of small, small spacecraft development, developing really advanced technology for small spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, in the internet era, uh, I was asked to help out uh, to win the Space Base in Infrared Program. Uh, the bottom line was they wanted someone to negate the advantage of a couple of other companies that lived near the customer. And I was asked to see what I could do. And I proposed a system of interconnecting all of the suppliers, the customer, the customer's uh, support, and the company on an integrated network with... Uh, and also proposed a web page for fully managing the whole of the programs, including integrating all the data from all the systems in the company hmm. and bringing it up into a single web page. Absolutely. So I got to do a lot of stuff. You did do a lot of stuff. So, and Jessica's pointing to her brain how smart this man is. Smarter, not smarter. Why? Yeah, Jessica's. Uh, uh, 
you know, her, she's got a, a business and work smarter, not harder. And that's what we're well, all trying good. to do. Well, that's good. Well, Jessica's very smart. We think so. We, uh, we need these young people around here to make us look smart here. The, uh, we're having a great conversation with Bruce Smith here. He worked during the Apollo era as one of the British engineers to come over here. We didn't quite get to that, Bruce, uh, here ending our conversation. The, of course, the British invasion of the rock and roll music from England in the 60s, uh, well documented. But this other British invasion in the 60s happened because NASA needed quality people. Tell us about that. Right, I will. Um, I was working at British Aircraft Corporation on the Seawolf Missile Guidance. Okay. I got a call to go for an interview in London uh, with uh, uh, Ernie van Valkenburg, chief engineer of Bendix, and they were recruiting British engineers. They'd been very successful in 1967 uh, in, in bringing quite a few people over, and so they decided to try to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And they hired quite a few people. Uh, uh, I won't tell you the whole story of how most of them, having given up their jobs, their houses, and their schools, they got telegrams from Bendix saying, don't come. They, Bendix hadn't won the Lunar Rover contract. Uh -huh. And... Bendix ended up having to find jobs for about 70 engineers. Hmm. Uh, Bendix only kept two engineers, and I happened to be one of them. Oh, really? Well, right. okay, you didn't get that telegram. That's part of the story you didn't tell me. But no. I thought it was interesting that NASA was, was tapping a talent pool worldwide, basically, for the Well, that, that's right. But you were mentioning the, you, you know, the British invasion and... Uh, all that happened with the music scene and the fashion scene. Fashion scene, And yes. I will tell you that my wife lived in central London. Uh -huh. She was part of that complete scene, all the Mary Quant, Quick King's Road scene. Oh, really? Bell the bottoms, whole hip thing. huggers, all the good Paisley and, patterns out there. Yeah. And yeah, there his wife's off here in the wings over right. there. Right. So uh, she was quite excited to comes to the United States, uh, the initial impressions were not brilliant, but it quickly changed. We went to Ann Arbor first. That's why. That was a big right. mistake. Well, there. it was in Ann Arbor. Dang, rib. It was, <laughs> a, it was Ann Arbor, 10 degrees, a howling wind, and the main street of Ann Arbor. Yeah. And Heather had, I looked over and she was standing on the street corner with tears in her eyes. <laughs> she said, what have you done to me? Anyway, we went around the corner and we, we saw the University of Michigan. And we were treated very well by all the people yeah. at Bendix and by every one in the United States. I would like to mention one thing. Of course. Um, when, we, when I'd been appointed, I was invited by... Dr. Langseth, to join all the scientists on the ALSEP effort mm -hmm. at Columbia University for a major do. And so I went, and I got to, you know, he said, Bruce, I want you to speak. I said, no, no, I don't know anything. Anyway, they hauled me in front of this crowd, a huge group of, of scientists, and, you know, I said, look, I've been appointed to head up this effort, uh, but quite frankly, I don't know anything about it right now, uh, but I've never failed at anything yet. <laughs> so, uh, and they all were very happy with that. The point I'm trying to make that in Britain, there is no way I would have ever been invited into such uh, an elevated group of scientists and accepted and accepted to work with me. The people of the United States were so incredibly generous mm. and everyone in the scientific community, I thought, was incredibly professional, of course, but also very friendly and very accepting. And uh, we were very grateful for that. That's so cool to say that. Where were you living? And then 50 years ago, the 
in, in California at the time, or uh, 50, when, when you were working for Bendix? With, oh, we were talking we, about we, the heat we, flow we, we, we were working in, uh, we were living in Ann Arbor. Oh, okay, so you were you just did spend time. We, in we lived Arbor. in Ann Arbor. Okay, and what was nice about it, it was living in living through the Michigan winters that we were completely unused to. Um, by uh, 1971, when our son was just under the age of two, mm -hmm. I said to Heather, look, I have to go down to Cocoa Beach. Uh, do you want to come? And she said, yeah, I'd like to. So when? I said, eight o'clock tomorrow morning. I've never seen her get ready so quickly in my <laughs> whole life. We came down yeah. to Cocoa Beach and... We have loved loved it here at Cocoa Beach ever since. We had a fabulous time here. Heather wanted to move to Florida, mm -hmm. and she still wants to move to Florida. <laughs> well, scattered thumbs. Well, you, if you didn't know, uh, the Cocoa Beach Regional Chamber of Commerce named our American Space Museum their Nonprofit of the Year. And uh, you deserve last it. Last week, and uh, we you were. You deserve it. Well, thank you very much. You you've seen a taste of what we do here, and. We certainly enjoyed you being on our program, Stay Curious, Bruce Smith. Fascinating stories that he told. We could go on for an hour. And, of course, you're always welcome back when you bring your wife, Heather, to the condo that she's going to buy at Cocoa Beach. There's uh, Better get better get quick because they're, they're, the real estate's pretty expensive. But uh, lessons learned here with Bruce Smith. I want to just think a little bit. What did I learn from this wonderful engineer that worked on the 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 apollo uh, alsap the apollo lunar science experiment package is what alsap stands for and i'll tell you what i learned was one they didn't bring any tools with them to fix anything all right because he's talking about john young tripping over the wire and messing up the heat flow experiment of apollo 16 in april 72 and they're trying to scrape the wires off with a Hasselblad film, uh, 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 film, uh, I need uh, Tom Usiak here to tell me the film. Yeah, the slides. Slides, slides, what we call them on our, uh, oh, which and, blocked the film from the And, the, the, and to the, undo the, the, the connector connections. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, they didn't have a screwdriver, they didn't have a pair of pliers, nothing like that. They had nothing. Them. You'd have thought that they just thought, maybe we ought to take a little kit with us there. Uh, did they, in subsequent missions, take a tool kit? Do you know? I do know that Marcus Langseth sent a long letter explaining that they needed a tool kit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something uh, hopefully you uh, Apollo lovers out there didn't know. And, of course, we wanted to thank Adrian Harrison for uh, the uh, BBC uh, documentary maker that has been in our museum. Don't know when, but he recommended Bruce Smith and his wife Heather visit here. And it sounds like they're not going to regret that, that choice at all. And uh, also the fact that Fred Hayes was very helpful with him uh, on the heat flow experiments, trying to figure out what to do when this accident did happen. And of course, Mr. Hayes is, I think, 88, and he is our emeritus board member, been a big supporter of our museum. We interviewed uh, Fred Hayes about a year ago on Zoom and uh, hope to get back to those, th those interviews again. But uh, thoroughly enjoyed what you've had to share here with us. Uh, he had a whole illustrious career like he just touched upon uh, with the uh, shuttle program and, the, and uh, or, well, the Hubble telescope and the International Space Station. And uh, have you got, uh, look, you know, our oral histories are made possible by the Mary Marie Louise G. West Endowment Fund that we put up there on the bottom. We're so grateful to the two daughters that uh, have bequeathed us a pretty good endowment to do oral histories with people like you, Bruce Smith. And it's important that people like you share these little stories to keep that history alive. Well, what, what impresses Heather and I is the fact that you all here are doing what you are doing and keeping, uh, keeping all of these wonderful things alive for so many people. Um, and, you know, my wife in particular has been commenting on the fact that she really admires you for it. Well, good. Well, I appreciate that. You all are, are uh, it's always great to have British people in our building. We, we've had British groups here, school uh, groups, that 
Uh, John Tribe, who was a North American hypergolic expert on the command module, right. you said you you met or know about John Tribe. Yeah, worked in the early days with Mercury. Uh, he, they've had a, we've got a whole group of British students that would come here every year. We miss them. We miss our our Japanese students and our Brazil students that would come every year. But we're hoping to get back to that because that's what we're all about. But I would like to just say one thing. Of course, we are Americans. We're not British. Okay. We used to be British, but we became Americans a long time ago. All right. And we love being Americans. <laughs> well, we've got that straight, of course. <laughs> that's British. That's right. Your British roots. Uh, well, we want to thank Bruce Smith uh, for this wonderful conversation on Stay Curious. Again, these oral histories we want are made possible by the Marie Louise G. West Endowment and things that they do uh, uh, that we're going to be having an interview almost every week now and, and sometimes too. Uh, we did want to talk about uh, ending here, how to support the American Space Museum. There's many ways to do that, including your purchases on the Amazon Smile program. We get a few nickels out of that uh, for your purchases. And the American Space Museum, Galaxy of Giving, that for a hundred dollars or more, we were going to spotlight you on our our galaxy of const our celebration constellations. And here's our first constellation uh, that we created from eleven thousand dollars worth of donations. There, these uh, dozen people have donated from a hundred dollars to uh, a few thousand to support our Stay Curious programs and these oral histories. And and we're so glad to have you part of this, Bruce Smith. Uh, fascinating story, don't you think? J Jessica, put your, uh, uh, her, Jessica, are helping co-produce this, but more importantly, changing the look of it behind there. She's a Star Trek person. Bruce got her science uniform on there. Right. But uh, she's hatching dreams into reality, and she's certainly doing that here at the American Space Museum with teaching uh, Marty Winkle and I, my other co-producer and cameraman, a lot of new tricks to help make our Stay Curious program relevant and, and uh, something that we're proud of. Uh, Marty will be back with us in a day or two. He's uh, taking a little extended break from the program. He's just fine. But uh, 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 I took a week's vacation, so Marty's resting up there, I think, so he can try and beat me on the golf course next time we get together because we do enjoy golf, something I... I, ha I started doing the beginning of the year. Do you golf, Bruce, or no. anything like that? No, I've never had time. Never had time. Uh, I just worry that I'm going to give him a bunch of homework. Yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah, Marty's worried about the homework that he's got to, to drive the, the whole computer thing that we're doing here with us. And look at this beautiful earth behind us here, Bruce. Uh, our globe is seen from the moon. You have helped bring back data from the moon to help us understand this alien world. And we just applaud you so much because this is what our American Space Museum is all about, is the, the, the space workers who have changed our world and right here in Brevard County. Is there something I didn't ask you or something you'd like to share with our listeners on Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube? Uh, no, I don't think so, unless Heather has anything. No, I think you've covered it she's very got well. The, she's got the realty listings over in her. Yeah, I've got looking the, at the, I, uh, That's where I get my... But I'm going to tell you, real, real estate, boy, it's hard to buy right now uh, because of what the private industries have brought back now. And we wish all of them well. We wish you well, Bruce Smith and Heather Smith. And thank you, everybody out there, for joining us on this program. Special edition interview with Bruce Smith here, who worked on Bendix and the Apollo era. And fascinating stories. Tell your friends to go and like us, subscribe to us, uh, follow. follow us, and uh, maybe support us financially. Uh, go to our website, the top of the page. It's easy to do. And you can, uh, like I said, we appreciate everybody out there enjoying our program. Thank you, sir, because what you've done for us that we're going to do again tomorrow is we are going to bring welcome back our stay curious people so we can bridge the space between us thank you everybody and we'll see you tomorrow from the american space museum thank you